Hello, welcome back to my training room. This is Survival Saturday with Johnny Tiger. Today is September 5th, 2020, and happy long weekend, everybody. Hopefully, you guys are all uh, observing your social distancing and staying safe. Speaking of staying safe, let's get on with Survival Saturday. I have heard a lot of people criticizing karate or karate, however you want to pronounce it, being a BS kind of system. It's not very good for self-defense, it's very showy, and you never see it all that effective in the UFC, etc, etc, etc. Now, I'm not here to defend karate. Uh, you know, just just for the just for your sanity and my sanity and everybody's, uh, uh, just for the sake of the general public, I'm just going to say uh, karate because that's what a lot of people are used to. Uh, I keep saying karate. You guys are going to think I'm being some kind of a Japanese snob or something like that, and I really don't like how that uh, come out. Anyway, I don't have the right accent for this crap. So when we talk about karate, a lot of people uh, say that it is a bad system, and in many ways they are right. In many ways, it is not a very functional system, at least most of the styles out there. Now there are some styles that will offer you some good stuff in there, but the fact remains, when you have a lot of black belt and two degree black belt and three degree black belt that go out there and get owned in the bar fight or go out there and get owned in a uh, MMA style ring match. So there's some kind of problem with the system. But be that as it may, karate, when you take away all the fluffs, you take away all the unnecessary stuff, all the katas, all the bowing, and all the spinning, and all the deep stepping, and all the uh, snapping the sleeve, and uh, swishing the belt, and all the uh, sidekick, and stuff like that. If you just look at the essence of what you're learning, you will take away some very, very valuable things that will allow you to go really far in your fighting career or in your self-defense career. But today I want to focus on one, but I'm going to talk about all three of what I took away from studying karate. Up to, and I didn't even get up to a black belt. Uh, I was a brown belt. But despite that, I have been able to beat my fair share of black belts and higher rank uh, karate fighters and practitioners uh, because, well, a lot of this is because I uh, have a lot of mixed style in my fighting, but also because I do not stick to textbook. I do not stick to the forms, the katas, the 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 the, the um, nitty bitty bits of uh, stuffing, the fluffs and all that stuff. I take the principle, the spirit of what I learn, and apply them however I can. As my Shorin Ryu Sensei pointed out, I was very very effective, but I was a disgrace to Shorin Ryu Karate because I did not move like a Shuren Ryu Karate fighter. Supposedly, when you are Shuren Ryu, you need to be able to move gracefully like a white crane. He says, I move more like a grizzly bear. So, hey, as long as I kept winning matches, whatever. So the three things that I take away from my years of karate training that served me very well in other styles 
in sparring, in tournament, in self-defense. Item number one was the idea to vanquish with every strike. When you really think about it, there's very few other martial arts that teach you to try to destroy and go through and penetrate with every movement. Karate is one of those. Although it is hard to see because it's buried under a lot of ceremony. But the essence of karate is conditioning your fist, conditioning your wrist, conditioning your forearm, conditioning your elbow, conditioning your knee, conditioning your shin, conditioning your foot. And what is the goal of all those conditioning is so you can break brick, so you can break board, so you can break rock. And what is the point of breaking brick and board and rock? The point is whatever you hit, you break. Whatever you strike, you go through it. The breaking board, the breaking brick, the breaking ice slab of ice cube, good for show. But they serve a much higher purpose. They teach you to have the mentality, to have it in your brain, that every time you throw a strike, you do not waste it. Every time you throw that strike, you connect and you vanquish, you destroy whatever you hit. Does it work all the time? Heck no. Of course it doesn't work all the time. We are not like in the cartoon. But as long as you have that mentality, it serves really, really good. Uh, even when you are exhausted. Let me give you an example. During my first Krav Maga combat exam, I went through a three hour body conditioning, hundreds and hundreds of push-ups, hundreds of sit-ups, uh, and a lot of, basically three hour non-stop, no water break, nothing, no washroom break, three hours of torture, and then half an hour of displaying my technique, and then the last part of the exam was I have to fend off uh, three attackers at once. They would come at me, they would come at me with sticks or training knives or stick a gun in my face or choke me or try to take me down. I was exhausted. I was tired. I, I didn't know if I could do it, but in my head I knew I had to pass this exam. I had to show them that this blind guy, this totally blind guy, could do this. So I called up my old karate training. In my head, I said to myself, Johnny, they are going to come at you and you are going to use only one strike on each person. They are no longer people. They are the slap of ice, they are the board I'm going to break. No matter what I use, I am going to throw out my fist, I'm going to throw out an elbow, I'm going to throw out a knee, I'm going to throw out a kick. Everything I do is going to be one hit, one hit only, and that one hit would have to come. Because if there are three of them, that would only take three hits, and then it's over. I wouldn't, I'm already tired, I don't have the energy to grapple with them, I don't have the energy to dance around, I don't have the energy to be fancy. One hit each, that's it. That combat exam turned out rather, uh, uh, let, let's just say it made me a little bit of a infamous person uh, in our school. And uh, it was a little bit embarrassing because I totally overkilled and I think I scared a lot of people and injured some. And if some of you are watching this video, I apologize. Uh, I was really psyched up before the exam. Uh, people, senior students were coming up to me and telling me that 
during the exam, people was also trying to hurt me, and sometimes people get hurt really bad, and I had to do everything I could to uh, survive. Otherwise, I would probably get injured really bad. So, <laughs> uh, being really tired and uh, really okay, yeah, I was kind of scared. I uh, I went really overboard with my striking, but. The fact remains that that karate mindset, strike and destroy, strike and destroy, go through, go through, go through, was very, very useful at a time when I was mentally and physically exhausted and still had to fend off three、uh, very determined attackers. The second thing that I learned from karate that benefited me a lot was a very unconventional way of moving when I am sparring or in tournament or when I'm fighting. I know a lot more stances, a lot more way to turn, a lot more way to shift my body weight rather than just a standard. One foot in the front, one foot in the back, the back foot on your toe.、Uh, the standard fight stance employed by kickboxers, MMA. I now know to step to the side and bring my foot in a shift, down, facing sideways, step out in the circular motion, turn back. I know a lot more about moving without tricking, moving without messing up my footwork.、Uh, my footwork. Has been improved immensely during my training in karate. If you look at UFC fighters that have some karate background, you will notice that those guys, even though they don't usually win with their karate technique, they usually are able to give their opponent a really hard time because of their unconventional stances. A very shifty、uh, footwork. By the way, having a very shifting, very flowing footwork also allow you to throw your opponent off balance very, very easily. Before I talk about item number three, which is actually the main focus of today. Let me just mention this: If you really think karate is garbage, then why was it that earlier in the early、uh, in the early 1900s, most of the marine policemen,、uh, army in the U.S., in Canada, in Taiwan? In Japan, in China, why is it that they had military personnel, the law enforcement personnel, study martial arts? And one of the martial arts they were studying was karate. Now, some of you will say, "Well, maybe that's the only thing they knew. The only thing they knew was taekwondo and karate." Don't kid yourself. Military intelligence around the world know about. Good fighting stuff. They know about judo. They know about wrestling. They know about boxing. They know about a lot of stuff. Yeah, they don't know everything, but they definitely know more than karate and taekwondo. But the reason that they train soldiers in these arts, in taekwondo, in judo. In karate, rather than in boxing or in wrestling, it's because these are martial arts that first discipline your heart, second strengthen your soul, and third help you move your body in a way that may benefit you on the battlefield. Okay, you learn boxing. It's not going to do you much good 
on the battlefield because now you don't have boxing gloves, you don't have helmet, you don't have mouth guard. You're not in the right kind of terrain. You're not in. But if you learn taekwondo, for example, okay, taekwondo is not really that good for self defense. A lot of us can say that, but. Earlier on, taekwondo was used a lot by the military for the military because originally taekwondo was developed for self-defense, for killing on the battlefield. Karate, same thing. Even though it now looks all watered down and more like dancing, once upon a time, karate was very very effective because of the ability. To strike really, really hard with your bare hand. Speaking of striking really, really hard, that is the third thing that I benefited from my karate training. Through the years, I have been asked many, many times. So how can a totally blind person be a striker? How come you're not a grappler? How come you're a striker? I said one of the things. That allow me to、uh, be a decent striker. I'm not going to stand here and say I'm a really, really good striker, because、uh, being totally blind, it does hamper me a little bit. I will say that if I had a bit of eyesight, I can probably be a really, really, really good striker. But、uh, be that as it may, I am still very decent when it comes to physical and kicks and striking. One of the things that I learned through karate was how to throw very, very hard punches、uh, in the unconventional way, and that is what we're here to look at today. Your conventional way of striking is a big right hand cross, big right hand hook. I'm only throwing right hand because you, you probably can't see my left side right now, anyway. So I'm just going to use right hand as demonstration. These punches are powerful, but they are intrinsically flawed in the sense that you need room to deliver them. So if I am ready to fight someone, if I am in a boxing gym or in a fighting ring, then I have all the time in the world to set up my punches. But if I'm standing at the bar, Standing at the bar, and someone behind me come up to menace me. Okay, and he's this close. If I turn around, I don't have a lot of room to work my big, powerful punches in there. Then in this case, if all I know are the jab, cross, hook, uppercut, then I have to try to circle out and make room. Not so. With standard karate punch,、uh, some people call this style the turning punch. Some turning call this the rotating punch. I personally call this the screw punch because the way I can make my student understand the how this punch works is I say, pretend you hold a screw between your middle. Finger and ring finger. Let me、uh, grab a screwdriver. I don't have a screw handy, but I have a screwdriver. Let me show you that. You guys seen this one in the last episode, I think. Screwdriver. So let's say you are trying to screw something into the wall. Pretend the screw come out. Between your middle finger and ring finger, and your job is to punch and screw this into the wall. So how we accomplish this really short but powerful punch is when we start our punch. My palm is facing up or toward me. But when I complete my punch, my palm is now facing the ground. This means while I'm punching, 
I'm turning my hand around, turning my arm over to use this turning motion for energy where there is no distance. So if I'm throwing a regular punch from the six inch away, that, that's not going to knock a person out. That's just going to piss them off. If I throw a karate punch from six inches away, every punch is knockout punch. Same distance, very big different, just by that turning over action, that screwing your fist into the person. You can apply this for your straight punches. Start your punch with the palm up, end your punch with palm down. You can do this with your hook punches. In hook punches, it's a little bit different. I would start with my palm facing the ground, and when I finish, my palm want to face up. So I'm turning as I'm hooking. I'm turning my head as I hook. As I hook, as I hook, okay, this takes away the need for big space to fight in. Uppercut, you can use this principle for uppercut as well. When I start my uppercut, I would have my palm facing the opponent. And as I, my fist go up, I turn my hand, so now my knuckle is facing them, and my palm facing toward myself. Turn! Very short distance, six inches. Uppercut. Uppercut. Right? It hardly takes any energy. All you take is that torque of your arm and your fist. Turn, 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 turn. Turn your fist over, turn your arm over as you complete your punch. And always aim with your middle finger and ring finger knuckles. That will ensure that everything line up at the end of your punch. So some people are saying, I, wait a second, I thought we hit with the pointer finger, the index finger, and the middle finger knuckle. That's because you're used to fighting wearing boxing gloves and MMA gloves. If you're you fighting bare hand, you try to use the first two knuckles, you're going to twist your wrist out of whack because they don't line up with your forearm properly. Thank you for checking out today's Survival Saturday. Stay safe out there. We'll be back again tomorrow for Soul Search Sunday. Now, good night.